the Millennium Kingdom of Christ. I want to present, um, which is in my opinion, the most complete thesis of this. Why do I call it a thesis? Because all these things are relatively new and we're still trying to piece things together. But what I notice is in all the um, Tataria video makers and Millennium Kingdom makers, they all have one thing in common. They leave out one very important thing that will increase the understanding. And I'm going to talk about what that is. Now, I don't want to go against them because because of them, I came to an understanding of this, right? I saw all these pictures, I saw all these things, and uh, I had to rediscover um, the whole Christianity myself, and it was because of them. Because I was always thinking in the future sense, right? All the destruction, all these things happen in the future, right? Because of these videos, I had to revise everything that I thought was true, right? But I hope that these video makers also will see this, so they can also pick something up, a thing or two from my video. Because I think when we put our minds together, we can come much further. So what do I mean by that one thing they miss? Well, all these video makers are either based on an unbelieving Christ, right? They love the Tataria view, Right, that it was a totally different civilization, totally different people, and some even say, no, no, it was giants did everything, right? And we just popped up out of nowhere, right? And then it is the Christian Millennium Kingdom makers who basically are still in the reformed uh, evangelical mindset that is based on verses like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This word world. Later in this video I'm going to talk about this word world. But all these makers are always talking about we find these buildings all over the world. Right? And humanity this. And humanity that. Right? And it is a misunderstanding. And if you think in a globalized fashion. And yes there are buildings find found in different parts of the world but if you have a globalistic mindset you will never figure out who these people truly are and what they truly did so before i go into the end of the old age into the new age into the millennium kingdom into the short season where satan is loosed and the lake of fire before i go there we need to go all the way back to the beginning to what beginning? Well, the beginning when God formed Adam. This is where our story starts. So it is a relatively new teaching that Adam is the father of humanity, the father of all races. That from Adam came different kinds of people, right? The Africans, the Chinese people, the Arabs, the Turks, everyone came from that one man. And that is that is what is believed now, right? Also, you have to understand the translations, right? It is talking about men, and in our modern mindset, right? Every one of every race is a man, so it's talking about the creation of all different men. But is this really what Genesis, Genesis is talking about? So, after God created all living things, God said in Genesis 1 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I already made a video showing you the many places that people are often also placed in this category of all creeping things, the beasts of the field, right, the fowls of the air, this category right but God said let us make man in our image so when we think man that means a male of every race but when you look at the Hebrew it does not say let us make man or human it says let us make Adam in our image if you look at Strong's 120 we see that Adam is a human a ready red 
complexion, right? Just like one nineteen, right? Able to blush to show blood in the face. So who are the people on this earth who are able to blush and are of a ruddy complexion? If you are still here after this, then you will find there is much more to discover before we even start to understand the Millennium Kingdom. So we see that the descendants of Adam were all through the Bible indeed called ruddy and of a fair complexion. Look at 1 Samuel. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, let's talk about King David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. We even see in the MSG that it is talking about apple-cheeked. So why is this so important to understand? It's because we now live in the season where Satan is loosed and there is nothing but deception, right? The church teaches us that Jesus looked like an Arab man, but Arabs are not of a ruddy complexion, are not able to blush and have not a fair countenance. And Jesus was a direct descendant of King David. So Jesus did not look Arab like they want you to believe in the Hollywood movies. So what does the word Arab mean? Where does that word come from? Why are these people called Arabs? Well, we see here in the Hebrew, Arab means to become darker, right? And that's exactly what happened to the descendants of Ishmael. But people say, well, uh, Jesus was not Arab, he was Jewish. Well, I made a long video about this already, but also the Jewish people are not uh, the descendants of Adam. Even though the forefather of the Jewish people was of Adam. I already made a very long video about the story of Esau and Jacob. Jacob did not intermix with the other peoples, right? But Esau did. So the story of Adam being the first lord, the first king, the first priest, and from his seed line, things would be restored and God's kingdom on earth would be built. And God made a promise to Abraham that from your seed, from your offspring, will come a nation and a multitude of nations. So Isaac and Rebekah had two children, Esau and Jacob. Esau was the firstborn, he came out first, the birthright as the oldest was for him. But Esau did not care about the birthright. Esau did not care about the land. Esau did not care about building God's kingdom. Esau did not care about the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac. So the bloodline went from Esau to Jacob. Right? So therefore God is called the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Esau did something that grieved his parents. What did Esau do? He went out and was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and Rebekah. So Esau lost the birthright and the dominion mandate. So what did Esau do? When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take him a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Like Esau did, Esau started to intermarry with Canaanites. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabajot, to be his wife. So Esau tried to stay within the family, but he disobeyed the direct orders 
So he went to Ishmael, and Ishmael was also a son of Abraham. This is how Esau tried to please his father, but also the sons of Ishmael were not according to the promised seed. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. The covenant from Abraham went to Isaac and from Isaac to Jacob. So God created Adam to have dominion and to subdue the world. He was the first king, first priest. God will build his kingdom on earth through the descendants of Adam. But we already know that they started to do things that were against God's will. It became a big mixture of things. So God flooded the earth. This was the first reset right but God continued through the man Noah because Noah was still perfect in his genealogy and from Noah came the sons Ham, Shem and Japheth right and Abraham came from Shem right grandfather Eber right that's where the Hebrews come from now you have Abraham Isaac Esau and Jacob no Esau fell away too now it was Jacob the promise building God's kingdom on earth was now in the hands of Jacob. So what happened to Esau? Well, Esau lost his birthright and Esau was angry with his brother Jacob until today, guys. Esau married Canaanites that didn't please his parents, so he went to the daughters of Ishmael that did not, it did not matter. The birthright was already broken and went to Isaac. So where did Esau go? Esau went to Mount Seir. Where is Mount Seir? It is in northern Arabia where the Ishmaelites lived. So how did the Ishmaelites become Arab to become darker? Because they were involved in slave trades from Africa and they started to intermix and this is how gradually the Ishmaelites became darker. But you see that the descendants of Esau, called the Edomites, who lived in Edom, also are very related to the Ishmaelites. Therefore, Edomites and Ishmaelites are basically cousins. We even see that they bounded together against Jacob, who was going to build God's kingdom. Keep not thou silent, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have counseled together with one consent. consent. They are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites. So some of you may ask, what has this got to do with the millennium reign of Christ and Satan's sword season? Well, like I said, in order to understand the millennium kingdom of Christ, you have to understand this first. So this was the first step of understanding. Then people might say, what do you mean? Are the Jewish people of today not the children of Israel, not the children of Jacob? Well, let's go to step two to gain understanding. So the promise of the birthright went to Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob was renamed Israel and his 12 sons were the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we all know the story how Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt and under Joshua they conquered the land of Canaan and all the tribes started to live in that area. But the 12 tribes, the kings started to be in disagreement with each other. So they split up. Now you had the northern kingdom of Israel 
and the southern kingdom of Judah. But the Israelites started to become disobedient. They started to intermarry with other peoples and different gods. They went into idolatry. So God caused the Assyrians to come in and take them away. And the northern house of Israel was no more. They also took Israelites from the southern kingdom of Judah, but especially in Jerusalem, there were still tribes left. Judah, Benjamin and Levites. Most of the tribes were taken away by the Assyrians. So most of the tribes were divorced and they became known as the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the remaining Israelites in Judah, they were not much better. Also they became under an iron yoke and Babylon took them away. So here we see when Babylon had all the power, the whole Babylonian Empire stretched all the way to Egypt and also the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah was part of the Babylonian Empire. But by that time basically the northern house was already taken away by Assyria, the southern house of Judah was taken away into the city of Babylon. So now was Judah empty for 70 years? No. Babylonians replaced the Israelites with Babylonians and Canaanites and also the Edomites from the south moved into the kingdom of Judah. So 70 years later the remaining Israelites went back to Judah but by that time it was already filled with Edomites, Babylonian, Canaanites and it became a multicultural society. So what did the Israelites do under the Maccabees? They forcefully told all the other people, especially the Edomites, to convert into their Abrahamic religion, the Hebrew religion. And that's what happened. These Edomites were circumcised and also had to uh, obey the law of Moses. So Babylon was taken over by the Persians. The Persians took the Israelites back to Judah. Right, and then you had King Alexander, the Greeks took over, and then the Roman Empire came. And in the time of this conversion, it was a Roman province, right? Judah was part of the Roman Empire. But these Edomites, very crafty, and with the Babylonian uh, monarch, uh, uh, aristocracy and everything, and money schemes, they absorbed the power. They installed even Edomite kings, like King Herod, was an Edomite king over Judah. But they adopted the law of Moses, but also brought Babylonian philosophy, Babylonian teachings, a twisting of the law, giving their own interpretations. Some even say that the Israelites who came back from Babylon already adopted Babylonian philosophy. But nevertheless, Judah was no longer controlled by the true Israelites. But what has all this got to do with the millennium of Christ? Well, I'm going to explain it further to you. This was not the end of the story. God gave Abraham a promise and that promise went also to Isaac and Jacob. Listen what God says to Jacob. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padam Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations, or a multitude of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So far we only had one nation, the land of Canaan. But the promise was that from his seed would come a multitude of nations. But how is that possible? Most of the tribes were already lost. They were taken away by the Assyrians. They were lost forever in history. Or were they? 
So when Jesus came to Judah, it was no longer under control of the Israelites and by the true law of Moses. There was a lot of corruption going on and King Herod even started the Herodian school of Pharisees where they learned the interpretation of the Babylonians and Moses mixed it up together. Paul was even part of that Heronian pharisaical school but Jesus rebuked them. King Herod the Edomite even installed other Edomites in high positions. Therefore, many of the Pharisees were not Israelites, they were Edomites. That's why the disciples asked, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, yes, but Jesus was going to do more than that. Jesus was going to fulfill the promise made to Abraham. So the Jews uh, the Pharisees constantly claimed that he also came from Abraham. Right? Well, yes, but they were not of the promised seed. right? But Jesus told them, your father Abraham, you claim to be of Abraham, or your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham was looking forward to the day of Christ, because through Christ the promise would be fulfilled. So Jesus came for his sheep. Who were his sheep? These were the children of Israel. These were his sheep. But the Pharisees tried to make them equal. They said, well, we are also from our father Abraham. But they came through Esau. Jesus even said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of ye father ye do. Right? He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning, even linking them all the way to Cain. Right? But they did not believe Jesus. And Jesus said, well, you believe not because you are not of my sheep. Like I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So Jesus did not say, you are not my sheep because you don't believe me. Jesus said, you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. But Jesus did not just come to take the power away from the Edomites and give that land of Canaan back. No, Jesus was going to establish the promise made to uh, Jeremiah, spoke to us, the promise of a new covenant for the children of Israel. Behold, the days come, said Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Remember? The house of Israel was long gone, was divorced, and all remaining was the house of Judah. Still the promise stands that with both the house of Israel and the house of Judah, God will make a new covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, said Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said Yahweh, I will put my law in their inner parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, said yet the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I remember the sin no more. So in this new covenant they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them unto the greatest, said the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. What is this talking about, guys? Because if you believe in futurism, and this is, by the way, where the Millennium Kingdom comes in, Right? If you believe futurism and the history they told us, you might think, well, when was there ever a time that people knew the Lord and they didn't need to teach each other? Well, with the understanding of the millennium reign, you understand that this actually happened. So people say, but Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. God so loved the world, right? So it's talking about all races of this world. Well, let's take a look at this word, world. So this word, world, in John 3.16, in Greek, is cosmos. 
it is an orderly arrangement. It is basically talking about God's society, God's orderly arrangement. And who did God use to bring orderly arrangement on earth, God's kingdom on earth? Yes, it was the descendants of Adam, and especially through the Israelites who were going to be a light to the world, right? The table of nations, the sons of Noah, right? We even see that the sons of Japheth would dwell in the tents of Shem. This is what cosmos means. Cosmos does not mean, for example, the planets and the stars. This is not what cosmos means. Also, cosmos does not mean the Eskimos and the Africans and the Chinese. This was God's orderly arrangement that God so loved. Also, the word world in Luke 2, 1 is in Greek, akumene. That was talking about the Roman Empire, not the entire world, right? This word world, Caesar wanted to tax the world, the King James says, but it was about, he wanted everyone in the Roman Empire to register themselves so he could have a census. Of course, the Roman Emperor was not concerned with uh, the Eskimos and the Chinese and the African people. It was about the Roman Empire. So this word world does not mean what we think what it means today. And if Jesus actually died for the whole world, what the church teaches, Jesus would be a hypocrite. Because there was a Canaanite woman who knew who he was, she believed him, she knew that he could miracles, and Jesus just rejected her. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But Jesus answered and said, I am not sent but unto the last sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall of the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And the daughter was made whole from that very house. So we see here an example that the kingdom that would be built was only going to be done through the children of Israel. The Canaanite woman could not be part of that. Nevertheless, she persuaded Jesus, she had faith in Jesus, and Jesus blessed her by healing her daughter. But still, Jesus said, I did not come but for the lost house, lost sheep of the house of Israel. But people say, well, wasn't she a Gentile? Jesus came for the Jews and the Gentiles. This is an other mistranslation which has caused uh, teachings like dispensationalism and the acceptance of the modern day Jewish people as the true Israelites and we are just Gentiles. I'm going to show you how also this is a false teaching. The church teaches us, well, the lost tribes are lost forever. We don't know where they are. That would make Jesus a failure because he said that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus knew exactly where they were. But Jesus had disciples. Jesus did not have time to go to all the sheep of Israel because he was he knew he was gonna get crucified. That's why he had apostles, and that's also why he sent Paul out to preach to them. The King James tells us, well, the gospel went first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, right? So that's a clear cut case the Jews rejected Jesus so God had no no choice but to go to Gentiles the church says these Gentiles were all the non-Jews right which also makes Jesus a failure because Jesus told us that he came for the Israelites so the word Gentile comes from the word the Latin word which was used 
for people of the same kind, family members, of the same clan, of the same family. That is what gentle originally means. But since the 1800s, they started to change the meaning of the word gentle into uh, that it means all non-Jews. But this is not what gentle means, guys. Even the Greek ethnos, that means nation or people. What is nation? A nation is a group of people of the same kind, with the same background, the same history. That is what a nation is. Also this they have changed, right? Now they make nations, it doesn't matter, right? Multiculturalism, that is a modern day nation, but it's not what the Bible is talking about. Ethnos is a group of people of the same kind. And we even see an ancient Greek literature that is that they use this word ethnos for groups of animals of the same kind, or flocks of birds of the same kind. So the gospel did not go to the Jews and to the non-Jews. The gospel went first to Judea. Christ went to Judea to the remaining Israelites who still kept the law. Then the gospel went to the ethnos, the people of the same kind, the lost tribes, the lost sheep of the house of Israel who no longer had the law. That's why Jesus said, now because of Christ there is no difference between a Jew and a Greek, at least your King James tells you this. He was talking about there is no difference between a Judean, an Israelite in Judah who still kept the law, and the nations, the Greeks, those who were Hellenized. There is no difference, all going to be saved by grace through faith because of what Christ did. It is no longer about the old covenant law of animal sacrifice, physical circumcision, which the Judeans still did, right? The lost tribes who were Hellenized were all over Europe. They no longer kept the law. They were divorced. They were not considered God's people. But now in Christ, they were going to be reunited, becoming one again. That's why Paul said that his gospel was the gospel of reconciliation. The lost tribes were divorced, but they were going to be reconciled. So who are these people who were reconciled and brought into the new covenant? Well, where did Paul go? Well, for example, the Greek people in Corinth. That was in Greece. And Paul went over there. And Paul tells these Greek people, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. So Paul is telling these Hellenized people, these people in Greece, that they are the descendants of the Israelites that came out of Egypt and now the good news was Christ died and he reconciled those people back to God. So these Greeks were literally Paul's kinsmen. Paul was, even though a Roman citizen, he was an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin and he calls these people in Europe his kinsmen. Even uh, Josephus, Google says he was a Jewish historian. No, he was not a Jewish historian. He was an historian from Judea, probably from the tribe of Levi. And he said that physically you could not tell the difference between a Judean and a Greek, other than circumcision, because the, the Israelites and Judah still circumcised their flesh and these Hellenites no longer circumcised themselves. But that was the only way to tell them apart. They looked exactly the same. So Paul went to Asia Minor, the modern day Turkey, which was not Islamic until much later. It was still part of a European people, right? Also part of the Byzantine Empire. Paul went, Paul went there, Paul went to Greece, Paul went to Rome, he even wanted to go to Spain. But we know that the other disciples already went to England and all the uh, gradually the gospel went into Europe, 
right? Modern day Christians think, well, Jesus will come back when the gospel is preached to every creature. That's why you have all these missionaries going to India. And well, maybe we have to find some more Eskimos because then Jesus will come back. But Paul said that the gospel was already preached to every creature under heaven. So now we are getting somewhere. Now we start to understand how the millennium reign of Christ started, right? Because the gospel was preached to every creature. Look at this verse. So Paul tells the believers in Colossians, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached, to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So these churches were established, right? And then we get the book of Revelation. The people waiting, they were waiting. They had to stay grounded. They had to stay firm. Christ in them was the hope of glory. What glory? Well, let's take a look at the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to shew unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by an angel unto his servant John. These things written should shortly come to pass. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall will because of him. Even so, Amen. So even the people who pleased him would still be alive to witness his coming and absorbing his kingdom. So either we believe the church or we just believe what is written. So remember the dream from Nebuchadnezzar about the statue, right? With Babylon, followed up immediately by the Media Persians, followed up immediately by Greece. Greece was immediately followed up by Rome and Rome was going to be followed up by the feet of iron and clay. Here it says the modern day church age. But is this true? Are we waiting thousands of years before the feet of iron and clay will be crushed? Or did this happen? Guys, all these empires would come and go. And the feet is the last phase. There is nothing beyond the feet of these worldly empires. Now the kingdom of Christ was going to come. So the age of the old covenant was over. Also Satan came falling out of heaven like a lightning. Right? Jesus saw that the Edomite power was over and God used the Romans to destroy the temple and get rid of that whole worldly happening, what's happening there with the Edomites, the Babylonians, it was all gone, right? But also the Roman Empire would be crushed. The Roman Empire, in my opinion, was a mix of iron and clay, the Christians together with the Romans, but also Rome would come to an end. Well, they tell you that they took a thousand years, right? Is first the western side of the Roman Empire, and then hundreds of years later, the other side. But what if this happened in a short period of time? I already showed a video how they added 700 years to the first millennium, but what if this all happened relatively quickly? So did Rome actually came to an end only politically, or also literally? And why do we find ruins all over Europe and other places in the world because don't think that the Romans were only in Europe of course they traveled the world we find Roman buildings all over the place these people traveled guys but how come that we find all these places like here like a mountain of mud surrounded it right how come that there is 20 feet of soil above all the Roman buildings right is it an accumulation of dust? No, of course not. Something actually happened there. Maybe this is where the angel threw a millstone in the water which caused a, a huge flood and therefore a mud flood burying everything. That is a possibility, guys. So this is so important to understand and it all leads up to fulfilling 
of prophecy, right? Um, there is more, there's molten buildings, there are scriptures to support that as well. Uh, I'm gonna need to make a part two, but um, the next part I will show you the start of the millennium reign of Christ. God bless you.